we are here for AI for everyone. So if you're not everyone, you, maybe you should leave and go to a different session. Uh, everybody else, you're allowed to stay. Please silence your phones. I am told as a speaker I have the right to answer your call if it goes off in my session. <laughs> At least I'm polite, so there's that. Canadians are pretty polite when answering the phone. Pass. That's why we're all here. It used to be Professional Association for SQL Server. We just all call it PASS now. It's gone through its evolution. I've been coming to PASS since 2011. I've never missed a PASS summit. It's a chance for me to meet all of you who are now my SQL family and uh, get to have a bit of a family reunion. And I've made some really great friends from all over the world doing that, and it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. There's a lot of resources that we have. Um, including the online newsletter. You'll get far more emails than you probably want, but that's typical with any organization. Um, and, but there's a lot of great information in there and a lot of local activities too. It's not just your past summit each year. There's a lot of local events. I probably speak at 12 different SQL Saturdays each year all across the world um, as an opportunity to further give more education to the community for, because not everybody can make it to Seattle or next year, Houston. Who am I? Why am I up here talking to you guys? I am a partner in ClearSight Solutions. My details for my LinkedIn and my Twitter are up there. Those are the two social medias I use the most. If you want to reach out to me, I am generally pretty good at answering questions. I have um, a blog at SQL Melody as well that you could use. And um, you can email me there or you can email me at sqlmelody at gmail.com. I'm usually pretty good at answering questions. PASS does upload the session slides. So the slides are up right now. Any modifications I do, I will upload as well. And my demo at the end of the day, when I've finished the demo, I will upload that as well for you to use. Uh, I am an MVP for the data platform, and I have been since 2016. Uh, if you don't know what that means, it just means that I love community and I love teaching and I love to talk to people about tech and helping people with tech issues. I've been the regional mentor for PASS since 2014, which just means that I try to help out all the chapter leaders and the events that happen within Canada for the data platform, as far as PASS is concerned. And I'm an author of a couple of books. The most recent one there is the SQL Server 2019 Administration, which is eminently due out. I wrote the sections on AI and big data clusters for that book with a couple of other authors, including um, William Asif, Randolph West um, and Sven who's, and Lewis, who are not here this week. One of the more important things, the AI pathway. That's why we're all here. Did, you, did everybody realize that when you came to this session, you came to the very first session of the AI pathway for PASS, the inaugural PASS AI pathway? No? Yes? yes. Some? Yes. Excellent. OK, that's an important piece. These pathways are very new. Um, so it's really important to give your feedback on this, of what you think of these pathways. Uh, in past, people have said that it's very difficult when you come to PASS to determine which sessions to go to if I want to learn something in particular. So what they've done this year is chose a, particular, a few topics that were quite uh, prevalent in the learning that people wanted to do, and they put them into pathways so that you could start with the very first session and continue on. So the one that you're uh, in today is the very first session, which happens to be my session, um, which is the intro to AI. So what I'm going to go over today are things that everybody needs to know and that give you a base understanding of the concepts. Then the next session is um, up there. I think the rooms are correct. I looked this morning to see if there was any room changes, and I don't think so. If you want to take a picture of the slide so that you remember if you don't have it in your in your guide, but it will be in the guidebook if you want to see an update of where these sessions are. The nice thing about this is once we get through Anna's session, which is next, which is going to be a deeper dive on some of the things I go into today. So if you liked what you saw today and you want more information, Anna's session will give you deeper information in some of the machine learning algorithms and some of the mathematics behind how the AI is done. And then at the bottom, including my AI for the DBA, there's going to be a number of sessions for each individual persona. So those personas depend on what you do in your job 
and how they relate to the work that you actually do, and why would you need to know AI for your job? But what are we going to talk about today? So we're going to talk about what is this ecosystem, how did we get there, and then a lot of the questions I get are around these buzzwords. What are these buzzwords? What do they mean? Why are they important? Uh, how do I tell one from another? And often people misuse them or misrepresent them. Sometimes they're used very generically and people are confused by what does that mean to me or why is it important? So we'll talk about a, bit of, a bit about that. We'll talk about what is the art of the possible? Where is this going as a technology? So the idea behind this AI for everyone is to give you an idea in your organization, even if you're not using it right now, how can you influence what, what you're doing within your organization as you move forward on any kind of AI pathway. Even if your organization isn't talking about it, as a technologist who is uh, at the forefront of their industry, which you absolutely all are, because I, I see some sh heads shaking, no, yes, you are all at the forefront of your, your industry because you're here. You're learning, you're progressing, and you're moving your career forward. So people are going to look to you as leaders to find out where their organization should go next. And then in our workplace, so what can we do next as within our, our workplace? Where can this go? What can we do? What are the important pieces that we need to know? So this is your foundation class. So let's talk about the ecosystem. It's not this. <laughs> so when I say AI, I automatically get a lot of questions of, is it going to take over the world? Um, or as my grandmother says, is that like the Terminator thing? I asked somebody this morning, uh, actually at lunch, I was just at lunch, and I asked somebody what, uh, whether their company was doing any AI, and she, she said to me that uh, she saw the iRobot movie, does that count? I said, well, not really. <laughs> not unless you saw it as a company outing then maybe. <laughs> so it's definitely not the Terminator, but it's surprising that that's what a lot of people think about. So there's so many facets of this. And the important thing to remember about this is we all work on Microsoft technologies. This session is about the Microsoft technologies and the conference is about Microsoft technologies. And Microsoft is very good at marketing. What large company or corporation isn't? And as much as we use AI to mean everything, we have to remember sometimes that at its core, it's really, at the moment, a marketing term. So keep that, keep that in mind. We'll get into some of the more important concepts as we go. So what is this ecosystem of AI? What does it look like and how did we get here? So in the beginning, there were, there's always a beginning, I guess, is the point to this. There's always a beginning of a journey, and that journey, that beginning is sometimes small. I mean, we can all debate how we all began, but there was a beginning, whether you start at Apes or somewhere else, um, there was all a beginning for all of us, and there's no different for this technology as well. So, but what does that mean to us as a technology professional? The enterprise is, is taking a serious interest in how we adopt AI. So it's important to know where it's going. Um, they want to know about return on investment. They want to know about the different things that they can do with these technologies as well. So it's important to know not just from your point of view as what you do as a technologist, but as a business as a whole. Because ultimately, we all serve a business, and that's what pays our paychecks. So back in 2016, was really when Microsoft started to have this journey. We had a lot of on-prem back then. We had private clouds. They went, from change, they went from SQL Server as a technology to talking about data platform as a technology. We changed from a uh, product-centric solution to a concept. And data platform is more of a concept. If you see how Microsoft has evolved, um, you'll notice that there's a lot more openness to open source, for example. It's not just about one particular technology, but how technologies work together, because data is no longer a single entity. We've got huge volumes of data, and how do we use that data to our best advantage? So as we moved from on-prem to, to private cloud or to hybrid cloud, there was a transition that started to happen where 
when we have all of our data in one place, how do we use that? We started getting integrations with Hadoop and other processes back in 2016. Then in 2017, Microsoft came out with this. And this is kind of where, to a certain degree, the marketing engine of Microsoft fell down a little bit because Cortana intelligence kept getting mixed up with the little bar at the bottom of your screen on the left that had you search whether it was web or files on your computer. That was also called Cortana. And Cortana intelligence got mixed up in all of that. And as a marketing engine, it kind of fell apart. But the concept was very good. It started to look at data bringing it all together in one place, which, didn't, which could still have been on-prem at that time, because it was not that long ago, but it, there was still a lot of data, and there still is to this day a lot of data on-prem, where we bring all of that data together to be able to analyze it as a whole, as opposed to looking at your data warehouse individually as a reporting engine. So it gave us the opportunity to look at different ways of utilizing that data. So combining it in a single place, and then being able to get information out of that, whether it was for people as reporting, whether it was applications, or even automated systems. And this was the start of the IoT generation. So that was the internet of things, bringing in volumes and volumes of data. Well, where does all of that data come from? One of the fun places that it came from was a couple of bots, which unfortunately no longer exist. I've checked a couple of times thinking that they'll bring them back. But when Microsoft was first testing some of their AI concepts, they needed huge volumes of data. So they had a couple of bots that allowed you to do this. One was called Murphy, and he was a snarky old man. He was that man that said, you know, you young kid, get off my lawn. Have you heard that sentence before? But that was kind of Murphy. And he, but he was funny, so he was fun to interact with. And I think a lot of people uh, played around with it. I used it for a lot of demos with kids. They thought it was hilarious. So here Murphy says that when I upload this photo that I'm a 44.8 year old woman with a ridiculous smile and I'm visually impaired. Okay, so that's true, I'm visually impaired. So you kind of get what I mean about a little bit snarky. So it was fun to play with, but it gave you an idea of how Microsoft was utilizing um, facial recognition. And it was, the, the fun part was playing with it. And I was asked the other day how accurate this was. At the time I did this, I was actually 45. So that was pretty darn accurate. I played around with it quite a bit because I was very curious. There's always that concept of how does it learn? How good is the facial recognition? How good is it compared to what it used to be? And I started doing these demos as this information came out. And I would play around with them over a series of time uh, from the time that I had found them until till the end and I would upload occasionally the exact same photo. And I would do that just to see how much the machine had actually learned. So this is the next one that I did. And I did this fairly often. I, was, I had gone on a European trip with my two kids because my oldest was about to graduate. I thought she's never gonna wanna hang out with her mother again, so get in a family trip now. I took them to Europe, I took them to the wax museum, and I ran into a wax version of Captain Picard, and I was so excited. Like, I did not take a, another photo with anybody in that entire museum except for my, my hero, Captain Picard. And so I st stood next to him, I was very excited, I took the photo, and I started uploading it, and I would get things back from, uh, from Murphy that would say, uh, you know, uh, Jean-Luc Picard, if he was wearing his suit, or if, he, if I put a, a version of him not dressed in character, it would give me his actual name. Or if he had, in this case, he had a red jacket on, but it wasn't his, um, his Starfleet uniform, but it was still red but it wouldn't necessarily recognize him as such. But what I found interesting about this photo is I loved the photo, I was super excited, I totally geeked out on it, I sent it to all of my friends and family, I was gonna get it blown up to a five by seven, put it on the wall in my office and be the proudest geek around, until I ran it through this re facial recognition. So what did I get? I see, oh, you brought some friends. You look like a 41.9 year old female with a Gromless grin, you require glasses because you are far from perfect. Well, that's, okay, I can accept that. You know, that, that's acceptable. 
But then he goes on to say, a 39-year-old human man with a mustache. And then another one, a 52.6-year-old man that is probably good at poker. All of a sudden, there's three people in this photo. I don't know if you noticed, but I got photobombed right there. He's famous now. He's been on this slide for a while. Um, <laughs> I don't realize, I don't know if he knows how famous he is. Uh, but I swear to you that none of my friends, none of my family, myself, my husband, none of my kids had ever noticed it before. But now that I've pointed it out to them, they can't unsee it. The photo is not on my wall in my office. <laughs> and I'm never going back to that museum again. Um, <laughs> but what was fascinating to me about it was so many people looked at the photo. We all loved the photo. We thought it was great. We were going to get it blown up, and nobody saw the extra person. Nobody noticed it until I pointed it out, and I didn't even notice it until I had run it through the Murphy bot. So it gives you a concept of how the computer can see things that we don't necessarily notice. It's, we have to make sure that we're using computers for what we want to use it for. I am not going to get into the ethics of AI today, because that's a whole other topic unto itself. But it's important to know what computers are really good at and why we would want to use them. So they're very good at seeing things that we miss, for sure. So this journey has taken us all the way to about 2018 now. The Murphy bot is no longer available, unfortunately. We're stuck with my old slides. And what we have in 2019 is a far more complex looking architecture. We no longer have that basic simplistic diagram. We have a huge amount of information where we can take facts and cognitive services. We've got QA Maker. We've got translation services. There's a whole number of things that we can do to expand on the use of that AI. We're no longer limited to small just chat bots. There's a number of um, translations that can be done. There's Q&A makers that are super simple to use. And these are called cognitive services. And Anu is going to go over that in her developer session. So if you're really interested in cognitive services, that'll be as part of the um, AI for the developer session. So it's important to know that there are options out there. What do, what do uh, we use these different AI services for? There's a lot of companies that have um, somebody in the corner of their website that allows you to have a conversation with them, to ask them about booking a hotel room or what services are available near a certain hotel, things like that, can actually be all automated through bots now. So that's really wonderful for repetitive tasks. So knowing what's probable, probable good uses for a computer is important. And that's definitely one of them. Anything that's a repetitive task is an excellent thing because computers don't get bored. They don't miss things because they're not paying attention or they get tired of doing something. So the art of the possible. What's coming next? What is this AI journey going to give us? And data and intelligent, um, intelligent agents is one of them. So that's what I had just spoken about in the previous slide. Some of those bots, whether it's a chat bot, or a Q&A maker, um, those bots have now progressed to allow us to integrate those into solutions at our own workplaces. A lot of people are using them also to integrate with applications. So all of those services are available to be used in applications. So you don't have to be limited to what you can code yourself. The, one of the nice things I like about this AI platform now is it's so evolved that there are services that we can just plunk in and use. You don't have to be a data scientist to be able to leverage AI in your workplace. There's a lot of things that you can do without it. It allows you to create business solutions that we would have otherwise had to have a team of developers do and create. So what is really AI? So in the future, what does AI look like? So we talk about AI as artificial intelligence, but I like to refer to it more as amplifying ingenuity. I think that's a much better marketing term, though maybe not as flashy, but really that's what it does. It's our, our opportunity to take some of these services and 
um, machine language, machine learning languages, or um, op or opportunities of services that Microsoft has already created, and leverage those to do more. What are some of the things that we can do? We can use reasoning to uh, predict and learn. W what this allows us to do is form conclusions and. The important thing to remember here is now we can do that with sometimes imperfect data. Some of the machine learning algorithms are so advanced that the data doesn't necessarily have to be perfect. There is bias in there, and again, that's an entirely other topic but that we won't get into today, but it is important to know that the volume of data is sometimes more important than the quality of the data. There's easier, if you're asking very specific questions, you can get very specific answers and you can get better answers. So one of the things you, I want you to take away from this is that as an organization, as you're moving towards AI, one of the really important things for us to know is our data. And who is better at knowing our data than the data professionals in the room? Regardless of what your company does, knowing your data is very important. So what it, the other thing it allows us to do is some understanding. Whether we're looking at those images and photos to get recognition, uh, one of the things that the Canadian government has recently done is they've started implementing facial recognition when traveling back from the United States. So I have this pass called a Nexus, and it allows me easier travel back and forth because I've gone through advanced screening process. And they're now, instead of me having to stop at a kiosk, they're gonna have facial recognition that will automatically populate a bunch of information. So it'll make it even faster for me to transfer across the border. Whether that's good or not, they used to just do it by fingerprints, now they're doing it with facial recognition. When governments and organizations like that are starting to do things with that facial recognition, you know it's gotten to a point where it's actually quite accurate. You wouldn't see security groups doing that sort of thing unless the data that was a reliable. Then natural language, translation, automation, and extrapolation. There are different services and bots out there that will do that, and one of our demos today is going to be about that. So I'm gonna do in a few minutes a translation demo, and one of my friends is gonna help me with that because although I'm Canadian, my French is absolutely atrocious. So who is who, or who is who in the zoo? These are the different words that often come up and people ask me, well, what is this and what is that and how does it relate to this other thing? I get a lot of those questions because to a lot of people, if you haven't used it, it just sounds like a marketing term. So what are these different things? So let's start at the beginning. Cognitive services. So those are the things that I've been talking about a lot. Those are the services. So sometimes the key is in one or two of the words. Services is a service. There's a group of them, there are a lot of them now. There used to be just one or two and I used to list them and tell people what they were, but now there's so many I don't bother listing them and they change daily, it seems, because they're starting to come so far. But these cognitive services are services that you can utilize within your code, within your application, within your organization, however you choose to use them, and d um, produce results or uh, applications and solutions within your organization or for other organizations if you're a consultant to solve problems. So if you need something that requires facial recognition, you can use a service to do that. If you need something that's going to do speech to text translation, you can do that. If you need something that's going to be a translator, you can do that as well. Those are just services that you can integrate into your applications. Data science. So data science is a little bit different. The key here is the science part. It's a science. Bet you didn't know that, no, I'm just kidding. Um, it's the use of scientific methods, processes, or algorithms uh, to extract knowledge and insights from, from your data. It's the way that we often refer to the way that we integrate our relational data. So if you're a DBA and you're used to a very structured relational database, and now we have this data lake, well, how are we gonna take all sorts of different information from all of those different places and get 
our next book that we want from Amazon. So those processes of creating algorithms is done as a scientist with data science. So it's about the science and you don't, the, it used to be years ago where I, I had looked it up and 92% of the jobs for data professionals in the UK required you to have, to be a de data scientist or have data science in your background. Now the field had been around for a long time, but unless you had a PhD in computer science and mathematics, you were not a data scientist. But that buzzword has come a long way. Luckily now, most people have realized that you don't have to be a data scientist to use a lot of these technologies. There's a new term coming around called a data engineer, and it's somebody who is very good at integrating all of those pieces. So a data engineer can sometimes be referred to as a data scientist, but really a data scientist often is somebody who has an actual PhD in computer science, or even more often, in mathematics. Machine learning. That's the next one. So machine learning is more about the ability for an algorithm to learn from itself. The key in that is the learning aspect. It's a machine that can learn. Now, there's a difference between that and AI. If you've heard of the, the Turing, Turing um, questions that you need to determine actual AI, uh, there's a lot of debate around that as well. So again, a topic we're not gonna cover today, unfortunately. But to, to say it, there, there is no actual AI happening. These are still very complex, but still computer programs that are doing things for us that have been pre-programmed or can learn from data. They're not learning on their own. So that's a, that's a fairly important distinction. These are um, algorithms, which is essentially code for a piece of programming that learns from the data that it gets. So that would be machine learning. The artificial intelligence, as I had mentioned, is not a Turing qualified artificial intelligence, which would mean that is able to analyze and learn on its own. This is applications and actual programs that are either learning on their own or learning from the data sets that we give it. And predictive analytics. This is the one that's usually the least understood, but the most often used. So it's, it's an interesting one. Predictive analytics is when you can make a prediction based on the algorithm. So when you go to Audible or Amazon to get your next book, it will give you a recommendation on what it thinks your next book will be. So sharing an account with my 17-year-old uh, daughter, who has a very different interest in books than I do, makes for a very difficult algorithm for Amazon, and I apologize for that. But <laughs> it does make it interesting for me. Uh, these algorithms are used to predict, it, I do a lot of work with banks, so it will predict whether or not um, I'm going to need a mortgage because in, it will have noticed that I've been out of school for X amount of years, or I, if, if on my profile it is noticed that I've recently changed my name, so maybe I got married, and then so then maybe I might need a mortgage. It'll make predictions like that as to what uh, what the next best product might be for me as a, as a client, just in the same way that Amazon would determine what the next book is that I want. Keeping in mind, yes, those do still have biases, right? So you'll, you'll have maybe heard a few years ago when Target first started using this and a, a father had gotten very upset with Target because he, he and his wife were elderly, were older, I shouldn't say elderly because it's my age. Um, <laughs> he and his wife were older, and there was no way they were going to have any more kids, and they were getting in the mail all of these um, coupons for diapers and baby formula. Well, apparently recently his daughter had bought a, birth con or a uh, pregnancy test, and he didn't know yet. So their um, predictive analytics were quite accurate, but he was still upset. So we're not going to get into the um, bias of that or the... Uh, how do we correctly use the data that we get out of it? The, the fact is our data gives us interesting results and, and usually quite accurate. How do these different pieces fit together? Is there any questions quickly before um, about the different pieces? Okay. 
check my time. So how do all of these different pieces fit together? I put, I've, I've got a couple of slides on this because it can be kind of confusing for a lot of people and I've, I've often had to repeat myself a number of times. I, I have an autistic daughter and over the years I've learned a number of different ways of teaching the same information because not everybody learns in the same way. So I'm gonna give you this in, three different way, in two different ways. So we've got data science and we're gonna use that the data science and the math to create something called an algorithm. That algorithm will be used within machine learning. So the machine is going to use that algorithm and learn. What, that, what, that ha what happens with that after that is it's going to develop into a cognitive service. So just like you would create any other program. So uh, say you wanted to create a program to teach a robot how to run across across the carpet. The same way that you would code that and all those different instructions is not dissimilar to what a data scientist would do with the algorithms within machine learning to create a service. So instead of having to teach this robotic car how to drive across your kitchen floor, you would just be able to drop a service in and it would know how to do it. Then what we do with that cognitive service is we use it to predict things. So if it was a prediction algorithm that we were gonna predict what Amazon thought was your next best book, we would use that prediction, or sorry, use that cognitive service to predict something. And collectively, we would call that artificial intelligence. So it's not actual artificial intelligence. Again, we're talking marketing words. It's an ecosystem really, of services and algorithms and things that we can use collectively to make all of that happen. So not everybody learns in words, but pictures are quite often helpful. And I found this quite helpful, to know what sort of fits inside of what. That our data science is the basis of all of this, but you don't have to be a data scientist to make this work for you. We can use the data science to create machine learning algorithms so that we can have cognitive services to use in our day-to-day -day work to predict things for our customers or for our business, and then we'll call that artificial intelligence. I hope that's as clear as mud. <laughs> that's about as best we can uh, hope for at the moment. But, that's how all of those terms kind of fit together. And I'm hoping that one of these diagrams will help you understand sort of that hierarchical movement of what the different pieces are and how they work. So AI today, that takes us sort of a, a bit of a background, takes us to where are we today and what's going on with AI. Is there anybody in here using AI now in their workplace? Are you using services or actual Algorithms. Excellent. Excellent. Anybody in here have Office 365? Okay, so all of you probably can use it today. And that's what we're going to do in our demo. So I'm going to do a demo for Microsoft Translate. Does anybody know what that is? Have you heard of it or seen it before? Kind of like Google Translate, but so much better. <laughs> I personally, oh, sorry, I personally think it's better. So I run, within my company, um, I have employees in Costa Rica, uh, Pakistan, and the UK, and we have customers all across the world. And not all, of our, all of, not all of my employees have English as a first language. So I found this, this tool to be super important and super helpful. So I'm just going to quickly slide my laptop over and do a demo. Of course, all over my business cards. It's always the way it works. All right. So most of you, if you have Office 365, you may have PowerPoint. I'm going to do this in PowerPoint because it's just the easiest way to demo it. And then I'll show you some other things within Office 365 quickly to be able to allow you to use it. So 
Remember how I said there's these services that you can just utilize. You don't have to actually program anything. So I will admit that I was lazy and I didn't program anything. Um, I'm going to switch this to duplicate so that you can actually see my screen. It would make so much more sense if you could actually see what I was doing. Excellent. Not a very good demo if you don't get to see it. So this is just another PowerPoint deck. I'm sure you've all seen PowerPoint before. Not super exciting. However, within the slideshow, there are a couple of new features. Back in 2016, when we had started this journey that I was telling you about, other than the bots, Microsoft was also working on a project through their garage. Microsoft Garage is where they, they use as an incubator for different ideas. And one of them was a translation service. So I had been demoing this back when I had to do a fair amount of code, actually, to integrate this with my PowerPoint. But now it is fully integrated, and when I, when I do an update, one day these services just showed up. So one of the things I can do, and I'll point out first, and I won't do it right now, but I can translate my slides. So what that does is it allows me to translate my slides into a number of different languages. I do a fair amount of work for the Canadian federal government. As a country, we have two official languages, English and French. I don't speak French. I definitely don't write French. So when I do presentations for them, I can do my presentations in two languages. I can speak in English and show them subtitles in French. When I deliver content, I can give them my presentations, including my slide decks, translated into French and I can translate all documents that I send to them. So I can translate my slides. The nice thing about that is all of this wordage at the bottom that, that we all use as our sort of like cheat notes as we're going through our presentations, all of those words also get translated. So that's quite handy for anybody who's just viewing it. One of the difficulties with that is that it doesn't translate um, pictures. So if you have words within a picture, those don't get translated, unless it's a part of the actual application itself. So something else. So I am going to start with subtitles. So I'm going to go through the demo um, English to English to start with. And then I'll get somebody from the audience, my special friend, to um, give you a demo with another language so you can see how the translation services work. So you can see here that I'm going to do English to English. The reason for that is the majority of us speak English. It'll be easier for you to see as a demonstration how the translation works, if it's actually picking up what I'm saying. Then it's going to do some custom speech recognition the reason for that is this is a technical conference. We have technical words. Things like SQL can be spelt multiple ways, and it's important for the application to be able to learn the differences to be able to be context appropriate. The microphone it's using is just the microphone off of my laptop. Super easy to use, everything that you would already have if you wanted to do a presentation. It takes a couple of minutes to start presenting and prep. And one of the first things that it's going to pop up is this QR code. It also has a web interface. So whether you're on Android or iPhone, there's an application called Microsoft Translator that you can download, that you can use for um, going on vacation even, if you want. Um, you can scan the QR code and follow along if you have the application. On your, on your phone, or if you just want to use the web interface, it'll show you a number of different things so that you could be interactive with this. I will, uh, in preparation for the demo in a little bit, I am going to open up the translator on my phone, and I'm going to scan the code. I 
it scans it really quickly. It asks me what language I want it translated to. And Thomas, what language would you like? German. German? Excellent. That was one of the languages I downloaded earlier. Thank goodness. <laughs> it was, you'd almost think we planned this. OK. So for Thomas, it's going to translate into German what I'm talking about. So he can see on the phone in German what I'm saying. He says it's good. Um, <laughs> he's trustworthy. Trust me. He's a friend. Um, he wouldn't lie for me in a demo, would he? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> You can sit down because you can hold on to that for a little bit. Um, don't send, in, send out any tweets on my behalf. <laughs> I will turn off the section where it allows you to, uh, I, will, I will mute you. Oh, I thought I had you. Oh, he, he was picking up on my microphone here, your, your text, that's why. Yeah, so if you, yeah. So the, uh, in the uh, demo, you'll see the rest of the information. I, I'll tell you a little bit more about this translator as we go. So every time you do a session like this, the QR code and the translate will be different. So it'll be, it'll be specific each time you use it. It is a service that is a cloud service. There is an option to save the translation at the end or save the transcript at the end if you choose to. So on the phone, it allows you to do a number of different languages and we'll get, we'll get into that, but if, if you hear a bunch of German being spoken, it's from the phone, not from me, because I don't know German. Um, the, the thing about this really is that we can use AI for things other than um, predicting books. We can use it for inclusivity. We can use it to allow um, subtitling in presentations, because my Canadian accent might be very difficult for somebody to understand. And the importance about technology is that we get our point across, not that everybody has to speak the same language. We're not quite to the day of the universal translator, which I would absolutely love, but we're sort of getting there. Um, I've sat in sessions before where people have used this technology as they speak, and if they have a heavy accent, I find it much easier to follow what, they're being, what is being said, even if they're still speaking English. Or for people who are hard of hearing, recently there was a SQL Saturday down in Austin and they had somebody, there's, there's a very large um, deaf community there and they were able to put things up on the screen using these subtitles to help people be included into the community, learn the information without having to have a very expensive translator. Translator um, can be as much as $2,000 a day or more depending on your event and what you need. So the ability to include all of this is great for accessibility as well as just kind of cool, but that's my opinion. It allows for audience participation. So if somebody in the audience is not comfortable speaking in front of a bunch of people in English, then they can ask the question in whatever language they choose and it will translate it on the screen for me as the presenter to be able to answer their question. I was just recently talking to somebody from uh, Latin America about this, and our SQL community has a huge Latin America uh, influence and a huge number of super intelligent speakers that are sometimes hindered from speaking at conferences because they're not able to portray what they want to say as comfortably in English as they are in their native language. So it gives them an opportunity to present as well, which I appreciate. So there are, um, at least at, when I last checked, there were 10 spoken languages that you could listen to on the phone. 
So that's why we were able to hear German on the phone. So it's almost like you're at the UN with having a little earpiece in your ear where if English is not your first language, you can be listening on your phone to my presentation in whichever language is most comfortable for you of the 10 spoken languages that it does. But there are 60 text languages. Um, re they used to do them automatically. Now there's a slight small piece that you need to have on your phone to have that piece um, be used. So I was madly downloading them all this morning. So anybody who wanted to try it could try it out during the presentation. Uh, but it doesn't take up a lot of room on your phone. It's something you can easily travel with. I've done this presentation in a number of different languages. And as you can imagine, because it's using machine learning algorithms, it is learning from the data that it gets. And as people modify it and verify the data it's using, so it's only as accurate as typically the volume of data that is being used. So you can imagine that English to English would be the most accurate. Um, other languages that are used more often, such as German or Spanish, which are very prevalent languages, are going to be more accurate. Some of the Arabic languages and some of the regional discrepancies in languages are somewhat less accurate, more because they just don't have the volume of data to become more accurate, if that makes sense. It does learn, and that's the key behind machine learning, is that opportunity for it to learn and get better at what it's doing. So the technical terms are much better. When I first started speaking about this on SQL Server, it would spell out S-E-Q-U-E-L. However, you can see that it waited until I was finished speaking, or sometimes it will take a couple of steps back when it's doing the translation, and based on the context of the sentence, will change whether it's SQL the book or SQL server being a technical term. When I first started doing this, when it was still part of the garage platform, it had no idea. Sometimes it still gets things a little bit wrong, but sometimes it gets it correct. The more you use it, the more accurate it gets. And that's the whole point behind the machine learning is it does get better. The text translation into 60 different languages is super useful. You can translate um, presentations. So if English is not your first language and you want to watch a presentation that was done at past summit, you have the, the PowerPoint deck, you can translate that and still get some of the context out of it, whereas you may otherwise have never been able to. So audience questions. This is your opportunity to shine, Thomas. So let me, let me get out of here and then I'm going to make sure that you can, I think I muted the audience. So I'm going to unmute the audience. I will make this a little bit bigger. <laughs> oh, that was a good one. <laughs> well, well played. So Thomas asked his question in German. Have you all voted? So that was a good one. I like that one. So it does work in multiple different languages. I didn't have to do anything to tell the uh, translator that that question was coming in in German. So does somebody want to try a different language? Oh, you'll have to pass, you'll have to pass with the phone. <coughs> well, it got some of it. Yeah, it's not quite Skynet. Good point. Thank you. Who's Mike? I got a hello from Mike. Nobody wants to own up to that one? All right. But you get the idea of how 
this can be used for so many other different things. I will go back to muting the audience before anybody says something that I might regret. <laughs> We're all professionals. Nobody would ever do that to me, would they? <laughs> right, exactly. So ultimately, I think this is fantastic for inclusivity. I think there are too many people who are left out of our community because they don't speak English, and I, I find that disappointing. So one of the goals for this AI pathway is obviously to introduce you guys to all of this. This technology is out there. We should all be using it, not just now, but in our, um, but in our day to day lives as much as we can. So I've, I've put it out to pass and I've started doing demos with them to show them this technology and to have this available to at every, each and every session next year. That's my goal. And Everybody on the AI pathway should now be using this. So as of this moment, every session you go to, at least on the AI pathway, should be using this so that it's inclusive for everyone on that pathway. If, uh, if they're not, then call them out on it if you're in their session, because they know they're supposed to be using it. Um, I will be using it in my AI, AI for the DBA. So I'm just going to put a pause on that. and switch back. Is there any questions on that? Um, yeah. Yep. Um, so Google Translate has also a, you know, I may have missed the first part of your session, but Google Translate has a, a similar thing that you, you speak on it and then you translate it. So what's the difference between this and that? Excellent question. So. The biggest difference between what Google does for Translate and what Microsoft is doing is two different companies, for starters. I mean, that's the basic answer. But what I like about the Microsoft Translate is the fact that it's integrated into what I do every day. So I can go to a website and use Google Translate, or I can do Google Translate on my phone, but that's not integrated into my day-to-day -day work. And that, that takes us very nicely Thank you for the segue. Into my next slide. So currently in Office 365, all of, um, all of the tools that you will use on a regular day-to-day -day basis are integrated with the Microsoft Translate. So although I'm using it on my phone and people are using it within a presentation, it's really nice for me when I get uh, an email from somebody who works for me in Costa Rica, and they send it to me in Spanish, I can translate it immediately. I can give my answer, translate it, and send it back. So no longer is language a barrier in doing business. So that's the biggest thing that I like about it. You have to remember, too, that we talked a little bit about bias and the differences in biases. And what Microsoft is doing with AI is very business-centric. So when I say SQL Server, it translates it correctly. And that's important to me when doing business, because I need those words to be portrayed correctly in the correct context to get my, my information across to whoever I'm speaking to. And I find that the Google uh, Translator is excellent, particularly if I'm going on vacation. But sometimes it's just a matter of the best tool for the best solution at the time of what you're doing. So not everything is going to, it's, it's like my daughter when she went to play volleyball, she had to have a specific pair of court shoes for volleyball as opposed to runners for you know, just street running. You have the right tool for the right job at the right time. So that's the biggest difference I would say between Google and Microsoft. I haven't delved into the differences in how well they translate things other than the technical terms that I use and I find that Microsoft um, tools translate what I need better, which makes sense because I use mostly Microsoft tools. The importance here for me is that it integrates seamlessly into how I do my job on a daily basis and that makes my life easier. So within each of these, whether they're available to you now should be a matter of what version of Office 365 you're on and what your admin permissions are based, or what your admin gives you for permissions based on 
um, your subscription that you have, but you should have all of these available to you uh, right now to be able to use, which is quite nice. Right, so the idioms is one of those things that is going to be learned within the algorithm. And usually it's done by either a data scientist or somebody who, who's working with the data scientist team to fine tune the algorithm itself. And that's where I find that, so not just idioms, but also those professional words, so the word SQL Server, would likely have been a specialized word that had been put aside or reviewed by a human. So there is still some human intervention, which is another reason we don't classify this as true AI. There is often intervention of some sort, which is why you see larger companies like Google and Microsoft being able to do these large projects because they need to have a certain amount of compute power and people power to get everything done. Excellent question. So in our workplace, what does this mean to us? We've seen it in our Office 365. What does it mean? And the next thing is also, why is it important? Why, why is it important to use AI? Why do we care? I have quite a number of statistics up there. And I wanted to put those up there because I was surprised, and I work in this industry, I was surprised at how much growth there is. This is not 120 billion for just AI business. This is growth over everything that has already happened in terms of business. And 84% of not just my industry or your industry, but every industry think that AI is going to be an advantage. So it's important for us to know what does AI actually mean? So when the marketing manager comes to you and says, I want AI, you don't just go, okay. <laughs> like, how do you answer that? What do you do? You have to know the questions to ask. You have to understand what they want. And a lot of that comes with that first question, which is why. AI is not exactly for everybody. There are a lot of things that you can do with it, but a lot of companies can waste a lot of time if they don't do it correctly. So it's important to ask why. Usually, that gets us to the last there on the top shelf is an increase in productivity. So if you don't have to, or a person in your company doesn't have to answer tedious questions all day long, they can do other things, and they can be more productive. So you may want something like Q&A Maker to allow it to answer questions on the web so that you don't have a dedicated resource necessarily to doing that. That resource can do something else. So that's all those business reasons why it's important. Why would you care as an administrator or as a professional? Integration is a huge issue for this. So as much as you may not be a data scientist, as a professional, in this industry, there's a lot of opportunities to, to grow your skill set and to get involved as an integrator and a guider. So just being able to take this information that I've given you today and explain it to your marketing department so they understand what AI is, so that they can be asking the right questions. You'll get a lot further as a company as a whole. Because one of the things that executives say, 37% of them say that the lack of understanding of all of these buzzwords is holding them back. They want to implement AI tomorrow, but their people say, I can't, or I don't know how, or how are we going to do this, and they're expecting those people to have the answers. So as long as you can show them that you understand what all the different pieces are and how they can be implemented, you can get further as a company and get to that roadmap or making that business plan to get that process done. And 9% of all new, new US jobs will be created in AI. So 9% of all new jobs, that's 
hundreds of thousands of new jobs that are going to be created in this industry going forward. So even if you're not using it now, the more you know about it, the more you understand it, it's going to be better for your career in the long run. So how many mornings do you wake up and say, I'm going to think through the process of how I'm going to put on my socks? <laughs> right? That's, we all think that. That's the first thing you think of when you wake up in the morning. How am I going to put on my socks? Let's see. What socks do I, am I going to wear today? What color are they going to be? Are they going to be wool or are they going to be cotton? And then when I have to put them on, how am I going to put them on? Nobody does that. Right? We don't think through all those different processes. We just put on our socks. So that kind of goes back to that picture I showed you of my hero, Captain Picard. I didn't see the photo bomber in the photo because I don't analyze every little thing in a photo when I see it. I see things as a whole. And we have that bias as humans. There's a lot of things we do without not really thinking about them. And that's how we get this either gut feeling or I think something is right. And that's called a heuristic. And the great thing about artificial intelligence is it takes that and breaks it down into all of these different questions. Starting with, am I even asking the right question? It's important to know that we're asking the right question before we even get started. And a lot of us don't even think about that. You don't think about what, really whether you should be putting on socks today or not. Most of us just do it, at least those of us in Canada, because it is cold. <laughs> but generally, there's so many things that we just don't think about. We take them for granted. But the computer's not going to do that. So it's going to go through and analyze all of these things for us. And that gives us more accurate results in the, in the long run. So it's important to know that there's a difference with how we think and how AI thinks. And what is the way that AI thinks? Some people think that AI is going to take over the world and do everything. Well, it may, eventually, but not by the year 2000, which was the original prediction from 1950. By the year 2000, you know, we would be all assimilated by the Borg, and that's not happening. We're not there yet. It does take a lot longer than, we're, than is expected. So what are the questions that AI can actually answer? But it, so it might surprise you. There's really only five questions that AI answers really well. And one of the things that people forget about when they get caught up in the marketing and the hype is that this, the more narrow the question, the more narrow the action that you want to do, the more accurate the solution is. So if I ask my teenage daughter if she wants to go shopping, I will get an answer of yes. But if I ask her what she wants, if I give her an open-ended question, say, what do you want to go shopping for? It could be almost anything. But if I ask her, do you want to go shop, or if I ask her, what type of jeans do you want to go shopping for? I'm going to get back an answer that's far more specific. So the more narrow we can make our questions and the more specific, the better we can get answers. So I've divvied these questions up into our regular questions and into our predictive analytics questions. So the ones at the end are our typical ones that we know from Amazon. I use as an example because it's one that most of us have interacted with. What book do you want next? That's the common one. Then after that, we have um, organization. How are we going to group items? Or how many of something or how much of something do we have? So when you're talking to your executives who want AI, you can think about these different questions and ask them, what do you really want to know with AI? What do you want to solve? And when you start to do those investigative discussions that you're having with them, you can get them, listen for what they want to resolve and listen for words such as, I want to find out how much or I want to know how many 
or I want to predict. And that will give you a better idea of whether something like machine learning is going to be able to solve some of the issues that they're trying to resolve. Sometimes they just want a robot that cleans their floor, but maybe that's just me. Um, <laughs> then when we start talking about services, there's a number of different services that can be used. These are some of the more common services that you can use to integrate. And as I had mentioned, um, Anu does a great job of talking about these in her session for the developer. So a lot more of this will be covered then. But I wanted to give you a taste of what some of the different um, cognitive services are that can be leveraged in, in your organization. So if those executives that are coming to you saying they want to do AI and they're talking about things like speech or I want to be able to search or I want to know um, something about something, those kinds of questions can be answered with some of the cognitive services and you can leverage those with APIs. You don't have to do all the coding. So those are quite handy to have. Just an awareness around so that you can answer those questions as those executives come to you as the thought leader in your industry. And one of the things I find is important th that I get a lot of questions about when I talk about this topic is, do I have to give up my data? Does my data have to be in the cloud? Because there are a lot of companies, I do a fair amount of work, both with the federal government and with banking systems, and quite often they don't want their data in the cloud. They want to be on-prem. So there are services that are available on-prem that you can use in containers. So something like the translator service is part of my Office 365 subscription. I don't have to pay for that. But that subscription does actually go up into the cloud to do the translation. Um, there are pieces that are integrated into the Office 365 to make all of that seamless. But if you're looking at leveraging or creating something brand new, you may have to either purchase a service or use a container on premise so that you're not sending your data to the cloud. That is more important depending on your country, your region, and your privacy policies. But it's important to know that Microsoft is trying to make this more universal and acceptable for every business to use. Um, <laughs> and that you can have containers that are used on premise to be able to do that process. That is the official end of the session in terms of uh, what, what I had to say. I wanted to make sure that you were aware of the evaluations. If nobody in any of the other sessions has told you about the evaluations, they are very important, not only to pass, to know what kind of content that you're looking for, but also to the speakers, to know what you think, to be able to improve for next time, for the next time that we speak, and to know what is of interest for you in the next PASS Summit. So we would appreciate if you could do your evaluations. And if anybody has any questions, I will be available for a few more minutes. Oops. I forgot to fill that out. I forgot to fill that out. <laughs>